occupied the, the, the territory. Russia consistently denied that it had anything to do with what was happening. There were just local self-defense forces uh, re re t taking over and demanding the referendum on independence from, from uh, Ukraine. Yet in April, in the middle of April, he held a pre press conference in Moscow and he said, just with a shrug of his shoulders, yes, of course, you know, our, our soldiers were standing there behind the local self-defense forces. And now we're getting something similar here. And repeatedly, uh, the assurances that he's given to international leaders, and particularly Dianga Merkel, apparently is feeling extremely uh, frustrated uh, by what she re re regards as lying from the Russian leader, uh, ha has led to this feeling again that the, the international community is simply being taken for a fool. All right. While NATO is uh, holding a, an emergency meeting this Friday, this uh, Friday morning in Brussels to address that crisis, thanks so much, Rob, for joining us there. We're crossing over now to Brussels, where we've got Franz van Getz, me McMahon on the line. Miva, what's on the agenda today? Well, namely, Shona, how to deal with that Russian aggression, all the points really that Rob just outlined. That meeting has been held in response to those satellite images that NATO published yesterday from Mons, showing artillery and some 1,000 troops and weapons in Ukraine. Ukraine has been calling on the international community in the last 24 hours to do more and to provide them with military assistance. However, it's unlikely we will see any big announcements at this morning's meeting. The thing is, NATO is, of course, preparing for that big summit in Wales next week, where, among other things, they will discuss their mission in ICE, uh, their ISAF mission in Afghanistan, defence budgets, and, of course, future relations with Russia and how to do more to help Ukraine. From sources I've spoken to here in NATO, it's unlikely that NATO would provide military assistance to Ukraine, but they will look in other, at other ways of, beef, of, of helping them and supporting them, namely with trust funds, etc., um, seemingly there's a bit of a mixed really opinion in, within NATO as well on how, how far to go really with Russia. Some, some countries, namely Poland and other Baltic states, they really want to get really tough vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but other others countries feel that they, don't, they shouldn't really aggravate Putin. But what I'm hearing, this summit will not, next week, will not be dominated by Russia, but they will look at a number of means at how to support, uh, how to um, beef up really the alliance. One source said to me, a strong NATO alliance is the only way to deal Deal with an aggressor like Russia. So what we're likely to hear come out of next week's summit is this NATO's readiness action plan. This is a plan to set up some bases in countries like Poland to, and to prepare troops to be, to be more ready and quick and be able to respond to future crises like what we've been seeing happening in the last few months with Russia. All right. Thanks so much, uh, Meade McMahon, reporting there from Brussels ahead of a NATO summit this morning there. Moving on to other world news now, and 43 UN peacekeepers stationed in the Golan Heights have been captured at the border crossing with Israel on the Syrian side. The United Nations called for their immediate release and warned another 81 blue helmets are trapped in the region. What we know, what is reported, is that they are from the Al Nusra Front. It's not ISIS. These are part of the militants that are fighting the Assad government, have been fighting them for more than three years now. And Kunetra, where the kidnapping and the hostage taking took place, is the only border crossing between Syria and Israel. Two days ago, the, the militants took control of that border crossing. And these, these um, peacekeepers are standing there actually to keep the peace between Israel and Syria. And and now that the militants control the crossing, they took these hostages, these peacekeepers hostage. And of course, negotiations are underway to release for their release. Now, does this mean that these militants are looking for a fight with Israel? They've been fighting in that region for a, a long time now, months and months, and neither Assad's government nor the militants have turned their guns on Israel. In fact, I would say they're too busy fighting with each other. They need all their energy for that battle. But they have said, the militants have said, ISIS and other militants have said, that when they're finished, when they've defeated Assad, then they will turn their guns on Israel. So it's, I think it's a waiting game now. It's a waiting game to see whether Assad retakes that border crossing and it's a waiting game to see when the militants do feel they can turn their guns south towards Israel.